Welcome back um, and hello to everyone who's joining online. My name is Martin Sandvu. I'm the Financial Times' European economics commentator and I'll be conducting this fireside chat with Nadia Calvino, who doesn't need much introduction and in any case it would take up the whole 30 minutes to, to say all the things you've done in the, for the European project. But you are here as the president of the European Investment Bank. Um, I thought you know, we want to hear quite a lot about what the, what the EIB is setting out to do, but I thought we could start because you have this very broad perspective from the Commission, from the political side, and now, of course, from the EIB, uh, on the very big topics we're actually here to solve. Um, this is a conference about financial integration or, or the, incomplete, the incompleteness of financial integration. But financial integration itself is a means to an end, and the end, as we all know, is to get the investments we need for the big transformations ahead of us. Um, and the, the problem, I suppose, is that we haven't been investing enough for a long time. We are still not. At the Commission economic forecast back in May last month, uh, Commission Gentiloni mentioned that we have still, even though we have strong-ish public investment on the back of the recovery fund, we still have sluggish private investment. So I thought I would start by just asking you, what is the, what is the core of the problem here? Why have we in Europe been investing too little for too long? What are the main obstacles to investing enough? Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to, to participate in this event. Um, I mean, everybody agrees that there is an investment gap, that Europe needs to invest more. There is also, I think, a quite broad agreement that it is the private sector that, that is uh, especially lagging behind when it comes to R&D and, and uh, other investments that are bringing innovation, productivity, gains, etc., in other parts of the world. And I think also in this forum, there probably is a lot of agreement on the fact that the lack of a deep and large capital markets at European level, I would also say the banking union is, is, <laughs> is not totally complete. Um, the, the fragmentation of financial markets in Europe uh, is, is, uh, is hindering our ability to, to mobilize these investments. This is not a new issue. This has been here for very long. There have been all these uh, reports. Uh, I have just realized many of them made by Italian leaders. I mean, Giovannini and now, of course, we have Letta and we're awaiting Draghi's report. So, and they all come to the same conclusions, but we've been for many years uh, trying from the European institutions without having a total success. So I'm sure you will now go on to ask about what can we do and, and what should be the, the priority? So, uh, but let me start by saying the, uh, the short answer is this lack of integrated financial markets is certainly uh, one, of the, one of the reasons for this uh, dragging behind. Just in very general terms, how does the EIB's work actually address the problem? Why do we get more investment because of what the EIB does, which you surely will tell us is, is happening? It would be even worse, I guess, without what the EIB does. I'll ask you yes. in a second, you know, where you hope to go from here. But just in general, what does the EIB actually contribute? Well, the, the European Investment Bank is in itself a capital market union instrument. We, because we do mobilize, we, we serve as a channel uh, between into investments and we mobilize private investment. Um, we mobilize the, the capital uh, endowment of the bank and also mandates and guarantees coming from the European budget. And I would say, I would argue it has been an excellent business for European countries because uh, in with the 22 billion euros that have paid in capital, we have mobilized 5 trillion euros in investment. Every year we invest around 88 billion euros, 90% of it inside the EU. So effectively, all the large infrastructures that have been built in, in Europe have been uh, financed uh, or have had a, a participation of the EIB. Many of the uh, top technology, green transition related investments have been financed by the EIB. Even the uh, BioNTech, uh, the company that developed the vaccine, had been financed by the EIB. So many people don't know, but we're actually underpinning many of these investments. And our contribution is twofold. Uh, first, the financial advantage, 
strong AAA rating, very strong balance sheet allows us to, pro to provide good financing conditions, but maybe just as importantly, technical expertise. Once the teams in the EIB say, this is a good project, we're going to invest, many other investors come in. And that is why I was referring to this leverage ability of the EIB uh, to mobilize private investment. And we are, we are doing it. It's not just an idea. This is, you know, we are a real life example of how public action can actually mobilize private investment. You mentioned that financial fragmentation is, is one of the big obstacles here. Um, why is it so difficult? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you've sat around the table of finance ministers that yeah. you know, should, should be making this happen. Yeah. So, well, let me, I'm going to be here uh, not very politically correct, and I'm going to be quite uh, uh, candid in telling you, uh, having been for, for many years, and some colleagues here know a, a long, uh, having devoted a, a lot of uh, time, effort, and personal investment, you know, into the banking union and the capital markets union when I was responsible for financial regulation in the, in the commission, then afterwards as a minister also in, in Spain, I devoted a lot of effort with a top-down approach. So this idea of you need a single supervisor, a single rule book, you need to remove the barriers between the, the countries. Uh, this this uh, is quite straightforward. And I think everybody agrees, actually, in general. When you get down to what does this mean? Does it mean that everything should be in Frankfurt? Mm. Everything should be in Paris? What is the role of Amsterdam? What is the role of, what about large and small member states that have specialized, uh, some of them, precisely in some sort of investment funds? Uh, is this meaning that we're going to lose this competitive edge, this competitive advantage? So it is when you go down into the nuts and bolts that the thing starts to become complicated. So since now I am no longer a politician or a policymaker uh, or you know, uh, putting forward the, the legislative initiatives. What I plan to do in, in the EIB, and I see you know, there is a growing appetite for it, is try to do it bottom up. So that we build on our role as an instrument for the capital market union and try to scale up what we're already doing. For example, we launched last year the European Tech Champions Initiative with contributions from member states mostly, also part of our capital. And this is serving, uh, has already mobilized 1 billion euros in investment for scaling up startups in Europe. This is a great success, uh, and so we should scale it up. Let's see how we can really uh, become a key player. We are already the largest public venture capital investor in Europe, the European Investment Fund is. Can we scale this up? Likewise with green bonds. We were, uh, the, the European Investment Bank was the first institution to issue green bonds. We've been spearheading these markets since 2007. Can we then see how to mobilize the green bond market in Europe? Uh, can we uh, do more in terms of standardization of instruments and then scaling up these instruments when it comes to the retrofitting of the housing uh, portfolio in Europe? We need to do massive investments for energy efficiency in SMEs, also in houses and, and buildings. Can we do something to create instruments that can be easily scaled up and therefore have an impact? You know, so. All these are ideas uh, which should allow us to uh, build or, and you know, strengthen the ability of, of Europe to channel savings to investments. We were just before saying, actually, the savings are there. We have the large insurance companies, also um, investment funds uh, are not comparable to the American investment funds, you know, but how can we scale them up and also channel those savings into European investments inside the EU? The, the savings are there, but a lot of them go out of the EU, right? So Letta in his report and also President Macron in his Europe speech uh, the other month pointed out that there are these 300 billion that flow out of the EU, uh, mostly to the US, that finance investments elsewhere. Uh, why aren't we better at you know, getting this money to actually pick investments here? Well, again, because many of the investments mean uh, you are investing in, let, let's talk about renewables. You're investing in renewables in Spain or in Italy or in Germany or, you know, you're never having an investment which is 
for the whole of Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the obstacles are very much into the nitty gritty of what all these re very bright reports have been saying for decades now, you know. It is the withholding tax, it is the tax systems generally, it is legislation about ownership, transfer of ownership, risk management, insolvency laws, you know, all these things make a difference. So. Uh, we have identified the issues. I, I think that through the uh, initiatives that we can spearhead from the European Investment Bank, working very closely with the national promotional banks, with the private institutions, they're all very interested to work together so that we can really identify where the ob obstacles are and try to then, uh, I was going to say put pressure, let's say uh, nudge, you know, uh, gently <laughs> uh, make a difference in terms of the top-down approach, which I am sure will take place in the next commission. I know Commissioner McGuinness has been talking about it this morning. No, we, we need to have a clear agenda, prioritize uh, and get things done in the next uh, mandate. I think the EIB can contribute bottom up uh, on the ground. And I'll, I anticipate here a little bit when we're going to go into your new missions and priorities, you've, you've set out eight of them for the EIB. One of them is to, to contribute to Capital Markets Union. So just before we let that go, uh, I mean, I appreciate your point about how the EIB can work at the bottom up and just make some of these investments happen. But before we let go of the top down thing, I mean, what are the, you are an institution that does cross border mm. or pan-European investment. So, so what are your you know, top one or two or three things that, that you would say that the politicians need to get done? Mm. I mean, do you need more centralized supervision to get mm. CMU to happen? What, what are the one or two top things you would advise at least or encourage um well, certainly, and, and the LETA report is very much spot on in saying, and we did do a big push uh, in, the, in, the, in the last uh, 10, 15 years in moving to regulations. We need to ensure that words mean exactly the same everywhere in Europe. Uh, centralised supervision and seeing how to reinforce uh, the existing uh, framework in Europe would certainly also help. Because then international investors and also players can, uh, you know, the rules are quite clear. And also you avoid forum shopping, which is obviously also a weakness. Uh, that that it, it does weaken the trust that is necessary for all these processes to move forward. Huh? I think trust is, is, is a key concept that we would need, you know, in order for this to really make a major uh, breakthrough. And, uh, and from this point of view, I think sing simple, uh, single supervision, single regulation, definitely. And we will have to make a decision whether it's harmonization or it is a 28th regime. Mm -hmm. Do we need a 28th regime uh, so that a specific Europe-wide regime for some areas, for some investments, so that we can really move fast in uh, making this a unified, a single market. Do you think that's a sensible idea? That could be a good I think, way. I think we will be confronted and uh, with this idea, I, I suspect, you know, mm -hmm. very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I mentioned that you've set out eight priorities. I, I, I'd really like you to tell us about where you see the IB going from here. You're still at the start uh, of your mandate. Maybe we're not going to go through all eight. Uh, let me just ask very broadly, where do you go from here? What is it that's going to change or be new? What is it that you'll keep? Mm -hmm. What's the vision? Well, the most important thing I would, uh, and that's priority number one for us, is consolidating our role as the climate bank. And in these days where there's so much uh, political discussion and so much noise about it, I think for Europe it's a no-brainer that we really have to keep leading the green transition. And the sooner the better. All analysis, all reports are clear that an orderly transition is, is cheaper, is much more efficient, mm -hmm. and would allow us to keep a leadership which we have uh, and that we need to preserve. That's part of the competitiveness of our economy. And that means having the cheapest and cleanest energy as soon as possible. So uh, after what happened to us and the wake up call of uh, these being at the heart of our strategic autonomy, businesses, companies are getting on with it. And, and we certainly the European Investment Bank is playing a key role to support the green transition in Europe. For example, we are investing in those technologies that will be key for the net zero economy from circular battery gigafactories to solar panel manufacturing, uh, but also of course the, the transition in the karma industry. 
disruptive uh, innovations and also scaling up existing mature technologies, green hydrogen, grids and interconnectors, you know, the, we are really uh, the top and the key investor in, in, in this area. And also very important player when it comes to mitigation, for example, water infrastructures, etc., supporting the agriculture sector and, and the rest of the economy, retrofitting houses, I already mentioned this. So green will continue to be top priority for us. Then accelerating digitalization and these new technologies, including the whole value chain, critical raw materials. I mean, uh, Vice President Nicola Baer, who's here with me today, she's very much committed uh, to, to support our actions and supporting investments in critical raw materials, having to do with our strategic autonomy also. That's uh, number two. Uh, and then goes defense, uh, uh, cohesion, policy, agriculture, bioeconomy, food security, also social infrastructures, health, education and skills, also housing, um, which is a top priority throughout the whole EU for all governments. Um, and focusing, let me close by, by signaling a point which is uh, also a top priority for us, which is focusing on impact investments outside the EU. Around 10% of our investments, around 8 billion a year, uh, are uh, devoted to investments in, in, to the rest of the world outside the EU. We have strategic partnerships which are, have a lot of impact with the World Health Organization. For example, we are financing the end polio project to end polio for good in the world or with the Vaccine Alliance establishing vaccine production facilities in Africa. So these are really important alliances. Uh, but right now, the top priority is supporting Ukraine, a successful enlargement, uh, supporting our neighborhood, Africa. So um, focusing uh, our investments outside the EU is also going to be an important priority going forward. So let, let's address some of those specifics in a second. But as a general follow up on that, um, I mean, all of these are, are very impressive um, ambitions. But you need to get your capital back. So there's a limit to what you can put money into. You have to put money into things where your capital comes back. That's how you have uh, such a high credit rating. Uh, so what you can offer is you know, the, the best terms of financing that can be had. But still, you can't go into loss-making uh, projects. So, so there's sort of, you depend a bit for some of these new technologies, maybe, or some of the, the green things that have big positive externalities. You depend on another side of both national and European government action to you know, have the grant offers, the subsidy offers, and so on. Is that where it should be? Is there enough of that? Or are you, in a sense, are you a bit constrained in finding as many projects you'd like to finance uh, because the, the grant support that may be needed for some kinds of marginal things isn't there? Well, the, if you talk to our teams, there is always a pressure for us to remain competitive, you know, from the financial point of view. And these varies depending on the moment, you know, depending on the liquidity in the market, the interest rates, etc. But the EIB has another very important feature which makes it different from commercial banks or investment banks, technical expertise. So this part, the technical analysis and the technical advice, the technical support we provide in designing and shaping up the projects from the financial but also from the technical engineering point of view to, to, to be clear. This makes the EIB a very important partner able to catalyze a cat catalyzing element you know in terms of uh, and, and the fact that we are long-term patient investors also is very important. Just I was mentioning this Northvolt uh, Giga factory in, in Sweden. I was very impressed by the fact that we supported the project when it was a startup. Mm -hmm. We helped the first phase, and now we have supported with one billion euros investment the extension of the plant. So we we have different financial instruments, and we can accompany a project for years. You know, it's not just one project, one operation. We know the clients, and we follow them throughout their life cycle. And I think this is something we need to build uh, more on. But uh, you, you touched upon the blending capacity. Do we, do we need grants to uh, be more competitive, to be more supportive? I would say the symbiosis between the European budget and the EIB is, is really uh, of the essence. Uh, because of the guarantees and mandates we get, which allow us to invest in Ukraine right now, to take the risk uh, in Ukraine because we have the backup, the guarantees from the EU budget and preserve our AAA uh, rating. 
uh, but also because the blending between grants and, and uh, loans coming from the IB or other financial instruments, I think will be also essential going forward to maximise the leverage and the impact uh, of public funding. There's a criticism you sometimes hear of the EU budget and maybe specifically the recovery fund Next Gen EU that it, it finances green transition projects and digital transition projects, but it doesn't focus enough on the cross-border dimension within Europe. Uh, so it, it's all quite sort of national projects uh, and there isn't enough capital going into, let's say, interconnectors for the grid across borders. Um, do you agree with that criticism first? And, and second, how can the EIB help to address that? Mm -hmm. Well, these are very different uh, matters because I think that the, the, the and here I, I have to, to say, having been the, the leader in the design of the, of the recovery and resilience plan in, in Spain, it was extremely difficult, but it's probably one of the recovery plans that does have cross-border investments and projects with Portugal and with uh, France. But it was very difficult in such a short period of time to actually build it up. You know, probably we have to see uh, uh, these as, as a one-off example, in particular with Portugal. But uh, generally, it was it was the planning and the and the speed required it for it to be very much focused on the national dimension. But still, the European budget has the connecting euro facility. It has other instruments that should allow us to really strengthen our uh, interconnectors, energy, but also transport interconnectors throughout the whole EU. And here, the EIB is a, is a, is an unavoidable, I would say, partner because we are financing the large grids, uh, the green hydrogen corridors, the international electricity interconnectors, and also uh, railway infrastructures, railway rail stock also investment. So we will certainly play a very important role going forward, as we are already doing. Huh? So, so just, just to understand, you're pushing back a bit at this idea that we're not doing enough at the cross-border dimension. I think there is a lot that's going on, but we need to maintain it or scale it up going forward because the needs and the, 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 the needs in terms of our infrastructures are, are enormous, of course. Since you mentioned Northvolt, I just want to ask, because that was one of the companies where we heard that they, after the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, they were thinking, oh, you know, maybe we should set up something in North America. And of course, we've heard a lot of claims about this. Uh, normally, on an anecdotal basis, company to company, is this a problem as you see it that companies have decided to invest less in the EU in order to invest more in North America? I'm, I'm sure there are other people who are best placed uh, to to reply to reply to that question. Let me say that we certainly are playing an important role in ensuring that Europe is developing uh, these key investments. I mentioned solar panels, also chip manufacturing in France, um, making you know the Iberian Peninsula a, a reference point for renewables and chip energy. So I think we have to focus on, um, more than focusing always on this competition outside, let's focus in, in maximizing productivity inside the EU and having good opportunities in the EU. You know. One of your priorities is cohesion. Um, I mean, cohesion, the origin of the whole policy had to do with fears that, that single market integration in general would lead to winners and losers. And of course, most European countries, if not all, have seen increased regional disparities over the last three, four decades. Um, we're at a financial integration conference, so I thought I would ask you whether financial integration, if we do get more a more uh, unified integrated capital market and banking market for that matter, are there cohesion risks coming from that that need to be addressed? And more generally, how do you think about cohesion at the EIB? So you have it as a priority, but what, what does it mean in terms of how you actually do your, your business of lending to address cohesion problem? Well, we invest uh, around 45% of our investments are in cohesion regions. Right. It is within the mandate of the EIB. And so we are particularly minded to uh, support regions which are um, less advanced, you know, and, and in many cases we are the only investor that, that is actually, you know, mobilizing activity in these regions. And I think this is a top priority and should continue to be a top priority because talent is equally distributed throughout the, the world. But opportunities are not. So we have every interest in bringing opportunities where talents and ideas are. And it means bringing opportunities throughout the whole EU. 
but also from a political point of view. Uh, I mean, what we see is that there are regions in the EU, in the in Europe that have uh, been uh, lagging behind and have. Um, moved down in terms of the of the well-being of the citizens for the last decades and these people feel uh, that uh, Europe and their political leaders are not delivering on their expectations and they're frustrated and they also feel insecure so Europe needs to deliver on its promise of prosperity which it has been doing since its inception but it means reaching out to all regions inside the EU and um, so going forward, I think that we will need to see how to also maximize the impact of the European budget and the EIB. I don't think we will be able not to have a public intervention to support and to make sure indeed that this risk does not materialize. As in, you know, in the 80s, the risk was of the integration of the market, you know, to be of the single market project to be leading to this concentration in, in, in most prosperous regions. So your role as the EIB is, is in part I think I hear you saying is to kind of tilt tilt the allocation of of finance from what a completely you know, a market without any intervention, without any public bodies uh, would do to tilt some of that credit flow to the falling behind regions. But you know, it, it, yes, and it's not just because it's the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do, because we need to have a diversified portfolio. So in order, you, you know, we, we need to, to have a, a portfolio that has different types of investments, are extremely low non-performing uh, uh, ratios, you know, in terms of, of the loans and the high quality of our portfolio. For, it requires that we have a geographically diversified portfolio, but also in, types, in the types of investments we take. So we can really be investing in cross-cutting border uh, new technologies, which are extremely risky, but we are also investing in infrastructures in more mature or you know uh, different different areas in in the EU. That that is what makes I think the EIB so strong. You're clearly very excited about what the EIB can do. Uh, you have requested publicly uh, to lift one limit on how much you can use your balance sheet to, to lend, uh, what's called the, the gearing ratio, or a cap on your gearing ratio. Can you tell us what it is, what, what the issue is, and what it is you would like to see happen? Yes, many, many uh, international financial institutions have these sort of statutory gearing ratios, which are capping the absolute size of the balance sheet. In our case, it is capped at 250% of our subscribed capital, which is also written, the number is written in the statutes. So this is a totally uh, risk insensitive uh, measure, which in practice means that a mandate, which has a guarantee, which for the own uh, uh, capital of the bank would be zero risk, is, is assessed the same way as a normal investment done uh, with our own capital. Uh, and it penalizes specifically uh, investments into the capital of other companies. So equity investments are particularly penalized by this kind of gearing ratio. So going forward, we want to be able to maintain the annual um, volumes that we have been doing in, in recent years. And I expect governors on Friday to uh, support that we just move the gearing ratio from the statutes to the board of governors to decide, you know, and that they also agree with to increase it in a manner which would allow us in the coming years to continue to do the same volumes. So your balance sheet currently is around 450 billion, is that It's right? more close to 600. 600. And you would like that? So would... would would making this change that you're requesting, would that allow you to expand that or is it that it would allow you to change the composition of the... It, it, yeah, you know what, what happens is since we are very long-term investors, the balance sheet, the loans are long-term loans. So my balance sheet or our balance sheet is very, is very large, but it doesn't mean that we're taking on additional risks, you know, and to a certain extent. So we have to do a more, a more uh, efficient balance sheet management. This is something that we're also working uh, on. But in the short run, the balance sheet is not going to go down. And so this would in practice require that we reduce our annual volumes going forward. And frankly, you cannot have a, a strong contribution with a shrinking balance sheet. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, you, you did mention the uh, the frustrations that have happened in struggling regions uh, when regional disparities have have occurred, and of course, we've seen some of the political fallout from that, uh, with the, the rise of political forces that are quite skeptical of a kind of pan-European, com-European approach to to most things. We saw that in the European elections. 
we obviously have some political turmoil in France at the moment. Are you, uh, I mean, are you worried that the political will to do all these things we've talked about is, is getting a little bit shaky? No, because I think that this, uh, again, it's uh, not only the right, but also the, the smart thing to do, you know, to invest in and accelerate the green transition to ensure that Europe continues to be uh, a leader in, in the key technologies for the future. I don't think uh, that these, these priorities, they have been uh, unanimously supported by all my interlocutors and the leaders, and, and they are sort of very much commonsensical, as, you know, as everybody understands. So I, I don't see it as, as such for the European Investment Bank, uh, but I do see that uh, citizens, and that's what I have seen in these last years, and we've gone through a lot in the last uh, five years, uh, citizens feel uncertain and feel, and uh, it's very easy to fuel fear, you know, in a population that has gone through so many unexpected uh, developments in, in the last years. And on substance, there's a new world order which is in the making and the geopolitical tensions are around us and are not uh, going down, but rather going up, you know. So there's also a question on the all the elements that have been underlying the strength of Europe and a strong voice of Europe in the world. And this also creates uncertainties. But when we look back, and when I look and try to do the balance of the of the mandate that is now coming to an end, I think there are many elements that should give us confidence and that should make us proud, because actually we did respond to the pandemic in a, in a good manner. We preserved financial stability in the European Union. We preserved also uh, growth and jobs in, in the European Union and the, and, the, and the economic tissue of our countries. We uh, did an excellent job in ensuring that the health uh, uh, situation was, was overcome as, as soon as possible. And we were also leading vaccine donation to the rest of the world, you know. And now with Russia, we're also reinforcing our energy markets and, and we are taking the measures that should allow us to be uh, stronger in this new geopolitical order. So. I would, I would hope, you know, that these messages are really permeating our societies so that we have more confidence uh, in the future, knowing that Europe has gone through crisis all the time. You know, it's a history that starts in the ashes of the Second World War, and I cannot remember a year where there was not a crisis somewhere in the European Union, you know? So if there's one thing that this union has shown is resilience, we should build on that going forward, you know? We start a little bit late, so I think there's time for one question from the audience, if, if anyone has one, before we move to the next bit of the program. Anyone who wants to ask a question? I have more, but... Uh... Okay, yeah, the gentleman there, please. Is, is there somebody who has a mic? Somebody's coming with a mic. Three people are coming with mics. Yeah, when Keep it short, please. Yeah, one one mic is enough. Um, so, so we talked a lot and about. Introduce yourself, please. Oh, uh, Malte Axwitter from the German Central Bank. Um, so we talked a lot about integration this this morning, um, and you you mentioned a, a few things that could be improved for further integration. Um, but do you think like what is the most desirable and maybe realistic way to get ahead? Is it like tiny incremental baby steps, or is it going to be a big bang where we make kind of progress in Europe? It has to be a big bang because we've already taken all the incremental tiny steps and uh, you know for the for the last um, 10 years 14 years 14 years we've been taking measures and uh, the low hanging fruit and all the um, all the possible steps have been taken under the Spanish presidency we we did push and got success in so many files but that's that, you know, now we're getting to the core, we're getting to the difficult part. And I really think there needs to be a top political uh, engagement. And, uh, and it has to be, I don't know whether a big bang in the sense of everything at the same time. Normally packages are easier to get through. <laughs> but, but it needs to be something which is material. You know, I don't think we can be for five years again beating around the bush. Uh, and as I was saying, this is a top priority for the EIB, and I hope we can contribute also in identifying what can be the game changers in, in this area. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting that Commissioner McGuinness this morning before you arrived used the same term about the low-hanging fruit have, have sort of been picked, so now is the time for more, more ambition. So the ambition level is clearly present, and it sounds like you are more optimistic about the next institutional cycle than, than many people are, but it may be because there is no realistic alternative. But uh, 
there's also no realistic alternative to us ending now because we have to move on with the rest of the program. So it just remains for me to say thank you so much, Nadia Calvino. Please join me in thanking her. Very good to see you. Thanks for talking to us.